Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I'm especially excited about today's episode because we're talking to Jordy Rose, who is the founder of one of the world's first quantum computing companies. It's a company called D-Wave that many of you may already have heard of. Now, Jordy really is a hard tech pioneer. At the time he founded D-Wave back in the 90s, next to no one was paying attention to quantum computing at all. And he's also been ahead of the game in a completely different area, and that's reinforcement learning. In fact, at the time I first met Jordy back in the mid-2010s, he was already very focused on the potential that reinforcement learning would have for augmenting the capabilities of existing AI systems, which is why he then went on to run another company called Kindred AI, which developed one of the first concrete applications of reinforcement learning in industry. But Jordy's ultimate focus is now on AGI, something that he's working on at his new startup, Sanctuary.ai. Now, Sanctuary's approach is based on a really exciting and unusual thesis, which is that one of the easiest paths to true AGI is going to be to build embodied systems, so AIs that actually have a physical form and structure and that can interact with a real physical environment. So we're going to be talking about that thesis as well as other questions around what happens when AGI hits, how humanity can best prepare itself for that event, and the broader AI alignment and AI safety problem. So I'm really looking forward to diving into this conversation. I hope you enjoy it as well. Hi, Jordy. Thanks so much for joining me for the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. Should be fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to do this. Uh, obviously, we've spoken before uh, quite a few times about AGI. I'm looking forward to this conversation to have like kind of a, a broader chat, not only about your, your background, but also what you're working on right now, which is very AGI relevant. For context, you were one of the pioneers of applied quantum computing, which is or was your main area of focus at a time when almost no one was paying attention to it. I'd love to start there. So can you, can you tell the story of how you became interested in quantum computing and how that led you to start working on what would eventually become D-Wave? Uh, yeah, you bet. So I, um, I was at UBC in grad school doing physics and the, uh, the area in which I was uh, doing research was called condensed matter theory, which is the study of materials at, at low temperatures. And in my case, the uh, the particular stuff that I studied were, was a material called a molecular magnet. And the uh, if you can think of a molecular magnet as being kind of a lattice of, of tiny little magnets, and those tiny little magnets um, flip around a lot. And how they do that uh, gives these materials their properties. And it turns out that, that as you cool a material like this, there's a very abrupt transition between these little magnets acting like quantum mechanical objects uh, somewhere around 300 millikelvin, so that's 0.3 degrees above absolute zero, so very, very cold temperatures. But the, the b behavior of these things uh, is remarkably different below this temperature. And uh, it occurred to me back then, so this would have been like late 1990s, that you might be able to build a computer out of something like that. Uh, and about at that time, there was some academic research about uh, using materials like this as potentially um, new kinds of probes of uh, crossovers to things like computer, computational complexity problems and things. So things that were not traditionally viewed as physics problems. And uh, our, again, around that time, there was some work at uh, MIT to take the, uh, these basic ideas that arose from the study of materials and, and, uh, and write them in the language of uh, this thing called quantum computation, which back in the late 90s, was nowhere near as commonly understood or talked about as it is today. Back then, it was uh, it was an academic thing almost entirely. Um, so at the, I, I, I got obsessed by this idea of could you actually build a computer out of something like this, and uh, um, that ended up being the inciting motivation for starting D-Wave. So when I when I finished my graduate work at UBC, I, I founded D-Wave. Uh, together, together with a few other people. And we started thinking about uh, how would you go about actually building a, uh, a quantum computer? And that was in 1999 when we founded the company. Well, yeah, and since, since then, D-Wave obviously has become known as a, like a leader in the quantum computing space. You've also gone on to focus more and more on machine learning, which now is basically your, your entire focus. And specifically this question of how to build AGIs I think in our conversation, I think one of the most important or interesting through lines has been you have this interesting embedded systems thesis about sort of what it would take to get to an AGI. Would you mind exploring that thesis a little bit, kind of unpacking it and, and why you're thinking about AGI in that way? Sure. Yeah, I would I would characterize my my technical interest as not really about machine learning because I think 
uh, we haven't said anything controversial yet, so I'll start. <laughs> it's about time. Uh, uh, cognition of the sort that all animals have, including humans. Uh, learning is a part of, but it's a small part. Uh, most of what we do is not learned. And the, the, the vast bulk of the, uh, the, uh, the equipment that we bring to bear on the problem of getting around the world um, is learned in a sense, it's learned over evolutionary scales by uh, evolution trying different things and the ones that are you know, able to succeed in making copies of themselves through time uh, those uh, trials, if you will, the the, the experiments in hyperparameter settings uh, that are successful, um, make it through and, and get passed on. So my my view, and I say like my is kind of the royal my because there's kind of a group of us who've been pursuing these types of ideas now for more than a decade. Is that the uh, the correct lens through which to look at general intelligence? is uh, through the lens of the, the the biological lens. So we have this example of what we think of as general intelligence, which is human-like, but we have lots of other general intelligences around us. Uh, it, virtually every biological organism is general in some sense. They have to deal with the peculiarities and uh, weirdnesses of the real physical world. We all do. Everything from bacteria to flatworms to oak trees to us all share the same physical universe and we have to find our way through it. So there is a sense in which uh, all evolved creatures have a type of general intelligence. And the, the thing that binds them together, the reason why I view it that way, is that they all have a, 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 a situation in the physical world. So all of these things have what you could think of as a body, a, a vehicle through which their actions are taken, and a vehicle through which information about the world comes into them through their senses. And uh, this picture of um, a, a, a thing that's situated inside an environment uh, would be common to anybody who studied reinforcement learning, because this is kind of the central premise of, of the worldview that reinforcement learning represents, is that you have, um, you have observations which are uh, partial in the sense that you can never know exactly what's out there. And then you have uh, as an action space, which are the sorts of things that you can do. And in a physical object, that means movement, mm -hmm. uh, usually. I mean, there are, there are some, there are some uh, things that we can argue that you could, do, you could take actions that aren't movement, um, and that's fine. But the, the basic premise still holds is that you, uh, you sense the world around you, you, you have partial understanding of what it is, and then you, t you move or you take an action and then uh, the, the fitness of the sequence of actions you take somehow matters. And in a biological system, it's related to survival and, you know, the other things that we need to do to get ourselves around the world without killing ourselves or otherwise making a mess of things. So the, the premise that we've always followed is that the, the, the clearest path to cutting through this extraordinarily difficult problem is to mimic uh, biological systems and the types of intelligence that they need to navigate the world. And so we build robots and we build control systems for robots and these control systems for robots to the extent that we can mimic the, um, the types of functionality that you'd imagine you'd need, not one-to-one, -one, you know, we're not copying the brain, but we're thinking about what properties of the brain uh, are required for you to, for example, know how uh, to reach out and grasp an object or to know how to walk on uneven terrain, um, or to know how to reason about the world, all of, in the ways that we believe we do, or we, we suspect, or you know, the sorts of ways that humans or other animals do it. So that's basically the thing. I think it's, it's, it's kind of obvious, and I think the reason why uh, you know, we are a little bit ahead in this game, if we are, is that we committed to it uh, early, you know, we've been doing this now for um, for about ten years. Uh, we have one uh, uh, exit from a product that is was used used these ideas in, in some way, and we continue to work on it and try to generalize these ideas. Actually, yeah, you were just telling me before we we started here that your last exit, Kindred, uh, actually is pretty recent, and mm -hmm. I think it'd be useful to provide a little bit of context on that because it is so core to this whole story. Yeah, sure. So the, the origins trace back to the, my last days at D-Wave. So I had a, a team around me that was working with our customers and 
everything that anybody at that point did with the D-Wave hardware had to do with a, with a type of AI problem, which is sampling over probability distribution. So there was a particular technical thing that we thought we might be able to do well. And we were in contact with a bunch of people who were thinking about that problem, more or less all researchers. Uh, and they tended to be the the kind of the cream of the crop because this was an exotic piece of technology and um, people were thinking kind of at the bleeding edge. So one of the members of my team, uh, Suzanne Gildert, um, had, an, had a, a series of ideas about how you turn some of these advanced AI ideas into control systems for robots that would be um, biologically inspired, quote unquote, uh, which, which means that they would be intended to be control systems that would allow a system to navigate the real world. And uh, I thought they were brilliant ideas that needed to uh, flourish. And D-Wave was not a robotics company and never would be. Uh, so I encouraged her to, to leave and, and start another company. So that she founded Kindred in 2014. And in the months that followed, uh, she called me up and asked me if I would be interested in coming and running it with the, the premise being that we would build a new type of control system for robots that could dramatically extend what they could do and potentially even in some limit create general intelligence. So I was absolutely fascinated by this as, as a thing. Uh, I've always thought that it's kind of obvious that uh, the, uh, that the sort of thing we call intelligence is much more important than what we call computation. Computation is a tool. It's a thing that you use to achieve some objective. But the setting of the objectives or the somehow the, the figuring out of what questions to ask is clearly more important than the tool. So I was more in, interested in that. So I left and uh, we ran it together for four years uh, up until 2018. And uh, we, we, we brought it through three rounds of financing up to a hundred million dollar valuation in um, would have been late 2017. Uh, we had cream of the crop in terms of investors and a very, very good technical team, including some of the founding members who are, who are absolutely excellent. And uh, we've, we turned the, the spotlight of all this technological stuff we've been working on on a, on, a, on a problem that really resolves down to one technical issue, which is, can you build a robot that can manipulate and grasp real world objects so this sounds really easy, right? Because any human can do it without thinking about it. But this idea of doing it in the real world turns out to be at the heart of why it's hard to build robots that can you know, make their way around the physical world. So we focused on that and in particular on a specific implementation of it in the e-commerce distribution center ecosystem. There's a series of places in these large distribution chains where things that are not easy to specify in advance because they change all the time you know what you buy is not the same this week as it is next week and there are millions and millions of these things that you can buy mm -hmm. so building a robot that could manipulate and grasp any of them and uh, we did that uh, it was the first uh, robot to use reinforcement learning in production this was one of the ideas that suzanne one of many ideas that she had woven together in this kind of cognitive architecture that she developed uh, and uh, it was very successful. Uh, last I heard, they'd done more than 100 million successful uh, grasps of objects in the wild, which is considerable. You know, think of it as an episode in reinforcement learning, yeah. a positively labeled episode. Um, and the, uh, the company was acquired for uh, 200 pounds uh, a couple days ago, uh, which in Canadian million. dollars, yeah, 200 million pounds, uh, which is about 350 million Canadian um, by a, a British uh, a British company, so the the way that the just getting back to the AGI question, so how does this intersect? So the underlying ideas that were used to generate that that product um, can be used to potentially use the same ideas, but building up a, a, a robot that differs in the sense that the robot is a general purpose robot. So this is a this is a new thing that doesn't quite exist yet, although we've been working on it pretty hard for many years is the idea of building a physical system, a, a, a robot, that isn't designed to do one thing, but it's designed to do anything a human can do. And if you can apply the same kinds of ideas that Suzanne developed in the kindred context, in the context of a general purpose robot, then you can deploy it in any place that does work. So it can make clothing, it can 
uh, serve you coffee at Starbucks. It can deliver your food. It can make you your food. It can take care of you when you're older. So the idea of building one robot that can do all of those things is the central premise that is is behind it and related to our approach to embodied cognition. This idea that you want to be able to build a physical body for something like a mind, mind being a robot control system, that allows the physical robot to be able to do and like be in the world in the same way that we are and navigate it and understand it in the same way we do. And what is the, what's the nature of the world model that gets built by, I mean, to the extent you can talk about it, obviously a lot of the stuff is going to be under wraps, but um, are there, are there things you can say about that world model, especially in the context of, you know, today's AI systems, which are very narrow. Like we look at even a system like GPT-3, which has a lot of really impressive few shot and zero shot behavior, getting to the point where we have like one system that can do a whole bunch of different things. Does that require like a, a paradigm shift beyond the GPT-3, like scale deep learning massively? Is, is there, is there something else going on under, under the hood here? Well, I mean, I, so I, I've always thought that the uh, you you get what you pay for, right? So if you if your objective is to build uh, something like GPT three, where you uh, you start from the premise that there are no priors, essentially, you know, what you're doing is just taking all the the data that you can find and then uh, and then processing that data and extracting the statistics of the data. So if you start from that premise, that's what you'll get. You'll get a system that, if you do it right, will be uh, absolutely great at that thing, which is uh, uh, learning about the statistics of the data that you send it. Now, that to me is uh, a very interesting thing, but it has nothing to do with general intelligence. And the, the and again, let controversy alert, uh, there are way, way different ways to think about how you understand what intelligence is and then how you go about building it. So I know I have utmost respect for those guys. I think that what they've done is technological. It's it's a, it's just an amazing thing. You know that GPT three thing is like alien technology. You know you don't even know what it is. Yeah. Uh, you kind of explore it experimentally, uh, not from first principles almost. Mm -hmm. So the uh, um, uh, I, I felt very weird actually when I started playing with it because it is really one of those uh, you know the blind man and the elephant thing where yeah. it, it's unclear what it is, even after you experiment it with, you know, I understand what it is, you know, I understand yeah. how it was built and all of that, but, but what the artifact that it created was is something very, very strange. And this idea of it being alien technology appeals to me because it's kind of like if aliens built something and we didn't know why, and they just gave it to us and it was that, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, so the my my approach uh, or our approach to how to how to do this is is very different. So, ours is almost on the other end of the spectrum. Where if you're going to build a robot that actually can do things in the real world in the way that you'd expect a squirrel or a you know a bird to, uh, the idea of learning over data with no priors makes little sense outside of an academic environment. So uh, there are people like Rich Sutton, who I admire and respect almost more than anyone else in this field, who take this perspective that what we really want to do is, uh, okay, he calls it the bitter lesson or something like that, is that we want to avoid, um, we want to avoid putting priors into systems and try to learn everything from scratch just to the extent that we can. And if we do that, then we're kind of limited by how smart we are and our computational power. And if you take, take it for granted that we're going to be as smart as we can be, the limit is computational power and our ability to do things in the, with intelligence in the world is ultimately limited by our access to compute cycles. So that's one perspective. I don't take that perspective at all. My, my perspective is that we have uh, as much evidence as we need about how uh, the priors need to be structured in order to hang learning on them where it's needed. So machine learning and particularly things like supervised learning, have a role in building a, uh, a cognition. For example, uh, visual systems, uh, converting pixels into representations. Clearly, that's going to be something connectionist. It's going to be a neural net of some sort. But what you do with the resultant representations is clearly, in my view, not just about learning. You know, there is something going on in our minds that we know quite well. You know, if you, if you think about the intersection with neuroscience, there's lots of clues about the ways things have to be. 
Uh, I'll, I'll give you one clear example of this. So we, uh, and it goes to your original question about like, how do we think about the world models that we build? So the first thing is the robots have world models. So that's, that's one thing, is that the, the, the internal life of one of these cognitions has a simulation of reality in it. Mm. Not at all obvious. It's not the way that all uh, you know, approaches to AI work, of course. Uh, but in this type of a system, a control system for a robot, the internal model of the world has to be high fidelity representation of the actual world. So think about the, the Matrix, right, the movie. So the people in the Matrix at the beginning have such a high fidelity uh, immersion in this simulated world that they can't tell it's not real. And a, a robot needs to have something very much like that, an immersive internal model of the world that is not only about uh, what you could think of as representations or in the game language, the scene graph of the environment, the things that are kind of platonically there and their properties, but also the, the, the renders of those things, which visually you can think of as what you're seeing. So step back a minute. And if you've got, say, an object on your desk or you're staring at something, there's a thing philosophically speaking, how do you think about this, 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 what's going on? So there's a thing there, you believe that. But what your eyes are seeing are uh, a render of that thing. The light bounces off of it and we get some picture of it on our retinas. And then something happens, something happens in our head. Uh, the, the way that our internal models work in these robots that we build, and also to a certain extent, the ones at Kindred, although to a lesser extent, it wasn't as necessary, is that there's a, an internal model of the world you can think of as like a video game, which is a one-to-one -one representation of what the thing is actually looking at. As it looks around and, it, and the pixels that hit its cam, the light that hits it cam its camera resolves into something that it might be able to recognize like a cup that generates a hypothesis that there actually is a cup there in its internal model. And in the video game such situation, you could think of as a cup popping into existence in your video game, exactly where the robot thinks it is. And that cup is then compared to the input from its pixels. And another important point about our perspective is that unlike nearly everybody else who does this sort of thing, to us, the simulation, the internal model of the world is the primary model. It's not the senses. So uh, it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking that what your brain imagines is happening is what you are feeling, touching, smelling, seeing, and hearing. That's not the way we approach the problem at all. The way we approach the problem is that what you think you're seeing, smelling, touching, and hearing is actually the inside model of you, the model you have in your head, touching the simulated stuff in your head and your senses are a secondary thing which ensures that that model doesn't go out of lockstep with your surroundings so this 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 peculiar notion that you know people have referred to sometimes as like uh, uh you know we we exist entirely inside this yeah. piece of bone we take it literally and the the senses then become checks they don't become primary, they're secondary. They're, they're kind of like uh, the anomaly detector signal that you use to ascertain whether or not your internal model of the world is in accordance with what your senses are telling you. So this flipping of the, of the, uh, of the game from senses are primary and we should be building supervised learning systems to see if there's a cat in front of a robot to no, the internal model is primary I have a model that there's a cat at that position, and now my senses are telling me whether or not I'm right. That flip is a core part of how we think you have to think about uh, cognition in, this, in the context of embodied cognition. If you're gonna build a robot that can make its way around the world, it needs one of those things, and you need to look at it in that way or else you're gonna get what we have today. Like, look around you, where's the robots? They're nowhere, unless you count cars. Uh, which you might, but this premise that we have machines that can do a bunch of stuff is just not being uh, seen. And, and like in quantum computing, the, ev the, the evidence in front of your face that you do not have it is evidence that the state of the art and the way that people are pursuing the problem is wrong. 
So it's not that the ways that robots are built are somehow going to gradually get better and somehow magically going to turn into something else. That won't happen. You know, robots have been moved around the same ways, you know, barring the, the kindreds and the covariants and other people who are trying to do things right. Um, the same way if, ever since there's been machines. There's something new that's needed. And so the, our, what we're working on is, is the extension of the kindred hypothesis to the general case to try to build a machine that has a mind uh, of a sort. And um, it's, a, it's able to navigate the world in the same way that a biological creature would and be able to do all sorts of things that are completely beyond the scope of any machine that's ever been built. That's, that's so fascinating. And it, it sounds like there are basically two different layers then to the, to the thesis here. The first one being, okay, we need an embodied system because that's one part of the evolution prior, let's say. Like we, we know that we've evolved to have bodies and that must be part of this. And then another part is this almost like, I don't know whether to call it like metacognitive or almost Buddhist or, or whatever you want to call it, but this perspective on the difference between noumena, like the object that really exists, and then our perceptions of it, that seems like it's its own separate prior. Is that sort of how you're thinking about it? Is it two different uh, camps or are they are they also linked in a way that maybe I can't think of? Well, they're, very, they're definitely linked because the, the, the fundamental reason for thinking about the world in terms of models and not senses is connected to function. And if you can think of it like this, like how do you actually pick an object up? And it's not as simple as you think. So if you're a sense first person, I'll just give a silly example, but it matters in robots. So let's say a sense person, sense first person, and I've got this thing called a cup, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sensing it by looking at it. Now, when I reach out to, to grab it, my hand occludes the object. Mm -hmm. So for a while, while I reach out to grab it, my senses can't tell it's a cup. Yeah. So how do I know it's still there? And how do I, so this is a silly example, but it's an example of, 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 the, of the, the first crack in a, a sense first uh, perspective. If you're trying to build a robot that can navigate the world. If, I, if I'm solely running say Clarify's cup detector on my robot, at some point in the grasp procedure, that cup detector is not going to fire anymore. And the robot is not like us, right? The robot doesn't know, quote unquote, it's cup mm -hmm. um, because you didn't tell it that there's something called object persistence, which is the fact that we know in physics, uh, F equals MA and all of that means that that thing is probably not going to move unless something else happens that I probably can detect, like, you know, a gust of wind or something. So the, 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 that, that very simple example, which is that the sense first approach to the world clearly is wrong in our case for something even as simple as reaching out and grasping an object uh, means that you have to add something else. And so if you're a roboticist wanting to solve that problem, you might say, yeah, well, we'll just, we'll just put an entry in a database that says somewhere that if I see a cup somewhere, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. But then what you have is a cascading hack that ends up not scaling. If you start just adding pieces like this one at a time, you're never going to pick that underwear up out of the bin because yeah. there's going to be something, some edge case, your brittle system that you tried to hand code will not work. So instead, let's say we, we take the, 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 the model first view. Mm -hmm. You bake all of the priors of the world into your model because we know what they are. There's this, you know, this, it's, it's absolutely peculiar to me that we've known Newton's laws for hundreds of years. We know how the world works. We don't need to learn it. We, it's given to us, at least at, at the scale at which humans act, you know, yeah. maybe quantum or general relativity. There's some questions, but the physics of cups are absolutely known. We don't need to learn anything about the physical world. We already know everything there is to know. So if you can build a simulation they can essentially just be an F equals MA solver that's good enough. Uh, you can pick things up in simulation. You can do things like the prior is the object stays there until it's moved. And now my senses are just verifying to some extent that the object is still there. So if my hand partially includes the cup, I don't care that my senses can't tell it's a cup. It can still see some pixels. And so if, I, if my, my model says there should be a cup there and I can still sort of see a little bit, it's enough. So this idea of putting the model first solves an enormous swath of problems in the uh, navigation of the world. So the, back to your question about priors, 
So the cogn cognitive system that runs in a robot that's supposed to be like a human's contains dozens of things like this, where you, ha you specify in advance, I know all of these things. It might be an engineering challenge to run them in real time. Like for example, the types of physics engines that run in uh, like say the, the physics engine that NVIDIA has or others of its sort, they're not designed to solve physics. What they're designed to do is solve the physics that you would look at if you were running a game. So there are engineering challenges in going from the, uh, the physics models that are the sort of, you know, the right ones uh, that include things like friction and surface stuff and all that, uh, but they're engineering challenges. And so, you know, like everything else I've ever done in my career, the, 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 the question of how you peel back a really complicated problem that isn't obvious how to solve is you first divide it into pieces and then you take each of the pieces seriously and then you do it right a priori. You don't use all the stuff that people have built before if it's wrong. And uh, you know, in quantum computing and in, in, in AGI, call it AGI, I don't even know what to call it, but this idea of building reasonable control systems for robots, the, the dogma, the state of the art has failed. And because of that, following the same path that people have laid out before will fail also. Now you'll get successes like Kindred where you can make a few billion dollars here and there and that's fine. But that's not, that's not what I care about. What I care about is trying to solve this problem of how do our minds work uh, well enough to build them. I view that as being the single most clear holy grail of all technology. You know, if you can solve this problem, it's bigger than any other problem that humans have ever conceived of. Everything we've ever done or thought, believed, dreamed, yeah. it all lives inside this thing. We've got to understand it. Why don't we? It really bothers me that... We're all, all 7 billion odd of us are carrying this thing around with us and we don't know how it works. Doesn't that bother everyone else? I mean, it's a travesty. We need to understand how this thing works. If, we, if, we're, gonna, if we're gonna call ourselves intelligent as a species, I think one of the tests of whether you get to call yourself that is the species has to understand where that thing comes from. <laughs> and right now we don't. So let's, let's, let's change that. I think it's time for, uh, for our the, our community, uh, machine learning researchers, AI researchers, to really take, and roboticists as well, to really take for, for uh, seriously the question of, can we actually solve this problem? And if we, if we were, how would we do it? So we have our own angle. Uh, it's not the only one. Uh, there are the data-driven approaches of, you know, Rich Sutton and Ilya Sutskever and these other folks who, you know, are, are doing it a different way. I think that it's time for us to to solve this problem and when we do there's going to be unlocked potential of the sort that's never happened in human history i mean the steam engine is going to look like a bump in the road compared to our ability to harness this particular type of technology we should do it and uh the time is now you know people are always thinking oh it's 20 100 years out those ideas that something is 20 years out have no weight in my mind because the the the, the good friend of mine, Eric Ladizinski, a guy I used, uh, used to work with at D-Wave, he said this thing and it stuck with me. He said, if you can do it in 20 years, just do what you would have done then now. And that that's kind of a really deep thing, is that if you can figure out what the right things to do are, you're not necessarily bottlenecked by a, a, a span of decades. So you just have to be smarter about how you attack the problem, be efficient and and solve the right kinds of problems in the right order, and you'll get there a lot sooner than people thought. I'm not saying that AGI is easy. It isn't. It's way harder than anything else I've ever worked on. Like, it's orders of magnitude more difficult than quantum computing. Like, orders of magnitude. It's not even in the same ballpark. But uh, I think it's also concomitantly more important. Like I said, a computer is just a tool. It just answers the questions that we pose to it if it's built correctly. But this thing that we're trying to understand, which is how we understand the world, wh wh what are we? What is, do we have a purpose? If so, how could we find out what it is? Um, is, is, there, is there any meaning to any of this? And if so, what is it? What is the eventual outcome of all of this if you go far enough into the future? All these questions are things we should be able to answer. And um, you know, that, that kind of answering those kinds of questions Trump's computation in you know some massive way. Well, and, and this ties into, I guess, some of the bigger questions about the future of AGI. Like one of the 
common concerns is that humans don't yet know the answers to a lot of those questions. What gives us meaning? What do we want? What's our morality? And as we start to look at embedding some of those moral frameworks in machines, either in the form of priors or in the form of a data-driven approach like the one OpenAI has taken, as you've highlighted, it, it sort, of, sort of forces us to have the, the philosophical rubber meet the road. Are you, are you concerned about, like, for example, what's been called the alignment problem, this idea of aligning machines with human values? Is that something that you think is surmountable or, or that we'll have to face soon? Well, I mean, there's this. This is a tough one because there's all sorts of ways that you can create technology that ends up having uh, unforeseen consequences. You know, we see it all over the place. You know, like social media is, is a prime example. Social media, in and of itself, is neutral. You know, it's a it's a technology that allows people to communicate in a certain way. But like everything else, in a, any co sufficiently complex system, it's very difficult to figure out what's going to happen when you mature a technology like that and it's going to have negative consequences as well as positive ones nothing is ever cut and dried you know everything is gray um, the looking at social media is a case study of how a powerful technology has good and bad parts and how to how a society should uh, deal with this sort of a thing i think is a good way to start having the discussion so one of the things that occurs is that you know take the social media example so social media has brought home a point that i think we sort of suspected but has made clear that uh the human mind is extremely vulnerable to certain uh call them idea pathogens hmm. so Jeez. if you yeah if you introduce an idea in the right context you can get people to believe it no matter what it is so I've often, when I was when I was younger, and even to a certain extent now, you wonder about something like Nazi Germany. Like, how could that happen? How could all of those people uh, agree to some things that you know any sane person would say? How how are we allowing this to happen? This has to end. So how does that how does that how does that work? And I think that the 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 social media experiment has shown us that. The mind of humans evolved in a particular type of landscape where it was very important to us to be part of the tribe. Mm -hmm. If you were if you were kicked out of the tribe for through most of our evolutionary history, you'd die. Yeah. Because we need, as a social animal with very little physical ability, we need to cohere and work together in order to uh, attain. Mm -hmm. So social media hijacks this. It creates tribes where your belonging to the tribe overwhelms your cognition. So your, your rational thinking about something gets overwhelmed by your need to belong. Mm -hmm. And if a million people seem to be saying the same thing, you are almost powerless to disagree. And this is not just about, uh, say, the right-wing Trumpist stuff. The left wing is just as bad. There are all sorts of idea pathogens that, that every political stripe um, adheres to without thinking through the consequences of them. And often they, they sound good on the surface, but if you start thinking about them, they, they rip apart. So the social media thing is, is both good and bad. Now, if you think about like this idea about how to treat AI as it emerges. So AI is going to be a, an extremely powerful thing that I think in our lifetime will lead to machines that we would consider to be sentient. So we will have discussions about whether the systems that we build within our lifetimes, I'm not going to put a date on it because, you know, you can't predict the future, but my sense is that the problems are not insurmountable in some period of time that we can, we can count. So uh, let's say that happens. We're in a very different space where we're no longer the, the top dogs. Mm -hmm in terms of, you know, some things like, you know, ability to reason or something like that. So then what? And I think it's the same thing is that we have to step back and ask, um, what is what is a salve or a bomb that gets that helps us navigate the good and the bad of the future? And as much as I hate to say it, I think this really traces back to um, to people learning at a very early age that there's a lot of value in skepticism and not believing what you're told. 
So if there was one thing that I think would be uh, the antiviral against all idea pathogens, it's to never believe anything you hear. So if you start from this premise that no matter what anybody tells you, whether it's your mom or a political figure or your advisor when you're a PhD student or your teacher when you're in grade school, everything they tell you, question it and don't believe it and then figure it out yourself. So that second part is hard, but I think this is the, this is the inoculation against the, the idea of pathogens is that think that anything, anytime anyone is telling you something, they're trying to get something from you that isn't in your best interest, even if it's just for you to agree with something. So don't, you'll put, put, your, put your own brain before the brain of the tribe and don't believe anything you hear, even if it sounds good on the surface and think it through and make up your own mind. And even then, you know, you're not going to necessarily get good outcomes with AI. I'm not so naive to think that you introduce something like this into human society that things couldn't go sideways. But I think that the the thinking for yourself part is the is the key to inoculating against all uh, uh, bad outcomes. Because I give you something, you could use it for, call it good or bad. Those are relative terms, but let's say there's some general sense of what that means. Uh, uh, you have to be able to reason about your situation well enough to be able to make good decisions about the technology, its use, its context, and all that. So for me, you know, I th my mental model of the world is that we are about to share the planet with a, 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 a Cambrian explosion of uh, new kinds of entity. They're not going to be like us. They're going to be uh, as alien as GPT-3 or as human-like as robots that are supposed to be like us. Um, there's going to be thousands of these things running around. And we are no longer any illusion that we had that we're kind of, quote unquote, in charge, which I hate. As a, That's the one of the worst idea of pathogens there is. This idea of control um, being a good thing is, uh, is going to go away. And it will have to because the, we won't have a choice. And it's not bad. You know, the, this idea of being in control is such a vague, abstract notion that I, I'm not sure even what it means. You know, I, I hear this all the time as an objective for how to deal with emerging AI technologies is that we have to be in control. That's really not very good as an idea on several levels. Again, if you peel it back, it doesn't make any sense. You're not in control now. I don't control whether I pay taxes. Go down the list of everything you do today and you tell me where you have agency. It's an illusion. And so the question isn't whether or not you're giving up control. The question is whether or not the future is better than the present. That's the key question. And I view the emergence of these new kinds of technologies as being a kind of flourishing. It enables us to do things that we couldn't have done before. Uh, and a, a, a human-like AI can be put inside a body that can survive space. If we really want to go and populate Mars and the rest, um, this is a key piece of that story. You know, can you put a physical human body on Mars? Sure. Can you send them to the next star system? Probably not. So the, 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 the flourishing of the kind of thing that we are, if we want that to, to go on, which I think everyone does, we don't want this great experiment in cognition to end. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Well, we, we, we flourish, we diversify, we, we, we branch. And all of this branching stuff doesn't mean that you're lesser. It means you're greater. You created all of this stuff that the future is going to hold. You are the, the progenitor of this massive explosion in things like us. You know, if you believe that being alive is a good thing, if you believe that being conscious is a positive, and you had the power to give dumb, inert, plastic and metal that gift, shouldn't you? You know, I think if the if you think about the world as being made up of things that think and enjoy and live and things that don't, and we could give the things that don't the same gift, isn't that a moral imperative that we do that? So this this business about the 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 moral and ethical considerations about AI. I think often end up being too provincial. You know, we think about 
today's technology where what we're talking about is like bias and data and stuff like that. I'm not interested in any of those conversations to tell you the truth because the, the, the real question isn't about the bias of data. The question is about when we get to the point of creating something that thinks, what is that going to be like? Because then, then we're talking about like, you know, the, uh, the, a nuclear bomb versus like, tra like a spark, you know, the difference between the two in terms of its impact on human society, they, they can't even be compared. They're on different scales. Yeah, the, the notion of an intelligence explosion, I think is really interesting when it, especially in the way it intersects with what you're describing here, which is like, yeah, we have these moral agents, which are, you know, AIs that are advanced enough that have cognition. We do have to think of them as morally valid agents. And I guess the, the question is like, so when it comes to an intelligence explosion, one of the concerns is that an intelligence explosion might actually lead to the eradication of human consciousness or cognition that the coexistence of human modes of thought and super advanced AIs that might be able to self-improve, that might be able to kind of reach heights of, of intellectual capacity and just rich cognitive consciousness that we can't even imagine might be impossible. Like, are you concerned about that, about the coexistence uh, sort of not being a possibility or an option for whatever reasons? Yes, but the, the, again, the, the, what I think the right way to think about this is you're choosing amongst options. So it's, it's not a simple matter of saying, you know, there could be a bad outcome if this particular thing happens. Because if you ask, is there bad outcomes in any potential future, the answer is yes. If we didn't create AI and we just continue on a certain path, what's the chance that we're still around in a couple hundred years? I don't yeah. think it's very good. Yeah. So the, 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 I think, again, the right way to think about this is not, is there a potential bad outcomes of potential of, of paths that we could take? That's wrong because there are bad outcomes in all of them. And it's a fallacy to think that just because you can point to one bad outcome in one, then the, that, that, that's the outcome is, is first, you know, guaranteed and somehow the only bad thing that could happen. There are a lot of bad things that could happen. Again, it, com it comes down to what do you value? So I value... Uh, the thing that we are, you know, I would rather be alive than, you know, a rock. And, and by the way, not everybody believes that. There's this great book I always re recommend to people called, uh, it's by Thomas Ligotti. It's called The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. So in it, he argues very coherently that consciousness is actually one of the worst things that could, you could possibly possess as a piece of matter. Uh, and 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 gives arguments for why that is. But if you take that argument aside and you don't believe it, and you think that being conscious is a good thing, then presumably we want more of it. Now, this thing about intelligence explosion, by the way, I don't believe that the conventional use of that term will ever come to pass. I think that what we call intelligence is situational. Intelligence is the ability to achieve goals in a specific type of environment. And it's not a number. So this is super important. It's not a thing that just grows. It's, it's a tool that you use to get what you want. And so what you want in a biological system is ultimately driven by, you know, the evolutionary pressures. In a machine, it's much more complicated because at least at the beginning, uh, it's set by human engineers. So if we want to build a reinforcement learning system that learns to play Go, we bake in the prior that winning that game is what we want. Um, we don't ask the machine, you know, how do you feel about playing Go? Uh, you tell it. Uh, and the kind of intelligence in that example is the ability to achieve the goal, which is to play go well. Uh, it has nothing, the intelligence itself has nothing to do, at least at some level of analysis with the goal itself. So I think that the, this intelligence explosion is not a good idea. I don't think it will actually happen in the sense of escalating capability. I think what will more likely happen is you'll get the Cambrian explosion type of thing where you have thousands of different kinds of intelligence, which are, you know, algorithmic structures for achieving different kinds of goals, and they'll all be suited to different niches. So GPT-3 as an example is great if you're, uh, if you're a, a creative person trying to come up with names for products. So at some point in the future, probably everybody in marketing is going to go away and there's going to be an, an AI based on the statistical properties of language and the something we know about persuasion. And all it will do is create ad copy. And it will be designed such that that's what it does. And even though you could say, wow, this thing is really sophisticated and boy, does it do that well, it's going to be an alien intelligence that doesn't 
doesn't ever want to turn the world into paper clips or any other of these ridiculous scenarios. It's structured such that that is what it does. And there are going to be other kinds of AIs built that have other goals and they can get better at achieving those goals. But unless something fundamental changes about the way that we think about machines, changing the goals uh, is a human exercise. So if you have a human want to change the goal of a machine to let's go shoot everybody, that's not a failure of the technology. Don't blame that on AI or cognition. Blame that on the person who thought that was a good idea. And so I think that, the, 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 again, it comes down to this business that the, the technology is gray. You know, it will create huge opportunities and flourishing for some people. It will create absolute bad things for others. It's always that way. Every technology ever in the history of the world has been like that. The question is, where does it end up in the balance? And I think that investing in understanding our minds in the balance is going to be the single best thing that has ever happened to the human condition. Uh, it will be uh, for all of the potential negatives that could happen, and I'm sure some of them will come to pass, and many of them we won't be able to predict. In the main, we will think that we were absolute barbarians before this transition point happened when we finally figured out how it works. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, we certainly do think that about the, our, our past selves in a lot, an awful lot of different contexts. So in some ways, it wouldn't be it would be such a shock to find, yeah, like 50 years later, when we have this technology thinking back, oh my God, we used to do dialysis. We used to put people in, in prisons for crime and, and things like that before we had better solutions. Um, there's, there's or even more, more, even more uh, radical, there was a time when our descendants didn't have language. Right. So we don't, we don't even think about those, those people as being human, but they were in the sense that they were our descendants. You know, you go back far enough in time and our direct, the, you know, your great, 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 great grandmother didn't have language. And so we view these great dividing lines in our uh, progression, um, uh, you know, as being kind of like things that are done with, you know, we, yeah. okay, now we're, now we're, we've learned how to speak in, in, you know, in Python. Okay, we're done. Yeah. No, <laughs> there's all sorts of other dividing lines. And I think the dividing line between a, uh, an entity that can understand the way that its internal working of, a, of the way that it, it processes the world and before is as great of a divide as an entity that doesn't have language and it does, maybe even a greater divide. And the, the fascinating thing, which makes me believe in the simulation hypothesis, by the way, is why is it that we live right at the time when that transition is happening? It seems un unlikely, uh, <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I think that there's, there's a, an interesting through line to what you've been talking about um, including with the reference to sort of the, the concentration camp guard in Nazi Germany, let's say, when you tie it back to this idea, you know, we say, oh, well, our ancestors didn't have language. They weren't even human. And the moment we say that, we kind of define this outgroup and we feel, I, I don't know if disgust is the right word, but there's like, it's like 3% disgust of, of like, oh man, we came from the simian origin and, and how low and so on. Whereas, you know, today, morally, we will be reprehensible to our future selves or whatever entities end up showing up, you know, 50 years, 100 years from now when this technology is around and we realize, oh my God, like this is how we've been treating each other. Um, the moral norms of, you know, just 10 years ago have completely shifted. And this idea that we, that we found this like one true moral framework that's going to be, you know, that's going to hold true for all time. Although I'm sure the concentration camp guard in Nazi Germany sure felt that they were on the right, the right track. I'm sure that Joseph Stalin's closest associates felt that they were on the right track. Uh, everyone seems to have this absolute moral confidence. And yet the one thing that seems to keep happening is that those moral values get flipped over every couple of years or decades. Is, is that something that like, uh, that you think is, is gonna, is, is ever going to change? Are we destined to keep seeing this, like this moral shift, even as we ease into AI, as AI starts to maybe even think about moral norms? Well, I, I don't feel uh, disgust personally to our, our, our predecessors. If anything, uh, I feel uh, admiration for mm -hmm. all living creatures because step back and consider that every, every creature that's ever lived has an unbroken chain of successful reproduction going back to the beginnings of life on Earth. That is an absolutely staggering thing. You know, you, you, the, 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 the bug that you swat, that, you know, that, that got in your way, that entity has an unbroken chain of successful reproduction going back to the beginnings of life on earth, that particular bug. 
Now, if that doesn't give you some like feeling of reverence for uh, your fellow creatures, I don't know what will. So if I think back to our, 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 our ancestors, you know, those guys had a lot to deal with. You know, the pr primates, there's a lot going for them, but there's also a lot not going for them. Uh, it's hard to be a primate. And uh, the, they somehow made it through. And then they somehow got to the point of being able to develop language. And so I, I feel like um, kind of sympathy for them in their pre-language days, uh, not discussed. And, and I think that the way that we're going to think about the who we are today, you know, when we go down a few generations and think back to this is, again, it's going to be more of a sympathy thing is that there are things we don't know today that are going to become clear. Mm. And in hindsight, it's going to be, you know, they didn't really know all of these things. And uh, we'll give them a pass because they weren't, a, they just didn't know. And the, you know, the, whether or not this kind of uh, consistent revolution of, of, of continual reveals keeps going into the future, where every time you kind of step up um, as a thing, you, something true is revealed about the nature of the universe that you didn't know before. Mm. Whether that continues forever, I doubt it. There's probably some limit to knowledge that you can have. And at some point you become as omniscient as an entity can become. Uh, and then there is nothing else. You, you've, you've reached some kind of intellectual nirvana where you kind of comprehended everything there is to know about everything. Uh, but we're so far from that now that uh, it's kind of an, just a kind of an intellectual exercise to think that far in the future. But in terms of like our AI transition that we're about to go through, the, the one thing that we're going to need to have as a species to make it through this is empathy. Is that we need to we need to have these ideas of circles of empathy. So you and everyone else cares more about the people around you than everything else. You don't care about the bug. You don't care about, even if you say you do, you don't care about people in Minnesota unless you live there or you have relatives there. It's just a fact of human nature that we care more about our children and our spouses and our families than we do about the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And right now, machines are in virtually no one's circle of empathy. Nobody cares. We don't consider them to have any uh, status, I suppose, in the conversation about uh, what it means to empathize. And that has to change at some point when these machines start being a little bit more like us and then a lot like us and then maybe even more than us the empathy that we need to develop for them as you know, fellow pieces of bundles of matter that move through the world uh, is gonna have to grow. And it's gonna have to grow not for altruistic reasons, but for survival reasons. Is that in, in, a, in, a, in a landscape where you have thousands of intelligent things wandering around all with different goals, the one thing that's gonna make everything work is figuring out how to work together. And the, the, you have to give up these ideas that you're going to have control because you don't even now, you know, no matter who you are, I don't care who you are, every single human in the world does not have freedom in the sense of being able to do whatever the hell you like. You live within a set of rules and those rules you can think of as lo losing control and you do it for a reason. It's because it's better for you to be within these, these bounds. Uh, it's better for you personally to be within these bounds, no matter who you are. So the, the, this idea of circles of empathy is something that I, it keeps coming back to me in terms of what, how we have to think about the world is empathize with your fellow, fellow matter. It doesn't have to just be things like, you know, dogs and cats and squirrels and your kids. The, the, the world around you is this very complex, mysterious thing. Somehow we have a property that most of the matter around us doesn't, but that could change. When it does, the world's going to become a very strange place. In order for us to find our place in it, we have to we have to rely on the angels of our better nature and not our um, the, the demons of our uh, evolutionary ancestry uh, in order to help guide us through it. I wonder too, in, in that respect, I mean, it really seems like the the um, embodied cognition strategy seems like it would be important to the extent that humans are. I imagine we'll have a harder time like developing empathy for GPT-5 than for some physically embodied system that like we can at least relate to because it has a physical form. Um, is, is that part of the calculation there as well? Yeah, well, the, again, going to this analogy of an alien intelligence, 
So let's say, you know, the aliens from Zebulon 5 come down and they're like clouds of gas. Can we have empathy for them? If so, why? I mean, they don't have bodies like we do. Um, what makes it so that we would think that they were like us? So I now ask the question of GPT-3 running around inside the, uh, you know, the voltage potentials of a bunch of computers. What is different about the alien from Zebulon 5 and these voltages running around in a computer? Why do you feel differently about those two things? And so I think a lot of this has to do with the mental models we have of what it means to be a person or a thing. Hmm. You know, we have, we have no problem, again, our evolutionary history tells us why, we have no problem ascribing personhood to a dog because we've lived with dogs for thousands of years. They've been our companions going back, you know, to the dawn of civilization and even before. The, uh, the, the, the fact that we would have trouble ascribing personhood to something as abstract as a, as a computer program is more a failing of our imagination than it is about some mm. fact about the world. So the, the um, you know, the future will have a lot of things like that, call them alien intelligences, that we wouldn't even think usually about ascribing anything related to what we think of intelligence to, but maybe we should. And there will be things that are embodied, like little robots wandering around, talking to us, doing things. Um, and the, the whether we ascribe personhood to them is a, is a big challenge. And I think a matter of, again, it's in this gray area. You know, if your driverless car can take you from one place to another, uh, is it really like us? Maybe, mm. sort of, but probably not. But now let's say it starts talking to me and I have conversations with it. Is that what we mean? Where is the line? Like, what is the property where we say, okay, now this thing is over the line. I have to start thinking about it like a fellow being. Is it the ability to feel pain or discomfort? What does that even mean? Because, yeah. you know, we live inside our brains, right? All pain and discomfort is, is a bunch of electrical signals traveling on your nerves to this wet, meaty thing inside your skull. So uh, presumably you could ascribe the same qualia or, you know, perspective to an AI if it was sufficiently like us to say this AI is in pain or suffering or somehow is not doing well. Should we feel sympathy or empathy? I think the answer is yes. And again, why? It's because if we have what we think is a moral compass, it doesn't only apply to us. That is a very toxic idea. And it's at the root of all of the worst ideas in human history. You mentioned it before, this idea of the other. It's very easy to say, I'm okay. I'm fully human. But you over there who don't look like me, you're not fully human. You don't have rights. I don't care how much you're suffering because you're not, you're not like me. This, this, this deep seated thing that we seem to have, which we've overcome to a certain extent, but not all the way, is not just about, say, racism or sexism. That's one manifestation of the hatred and fear of the other, but it's not the only thing. And in some not too far away future, uh, we're going to have to start thinking very deeply about what it means to really be a moral and ethical person or entity. It's not just about things that look like you. It's about a much broader uh, circle. So what's in the circle? And I don't know. And I don't think that the circle is a bright, sharp line. It's gray. Mm. Certain things, you know, what are clearly in the circle. Certain things maybe are clearly outside, but the middle is, is a very difficult thing and it moves over time. You know, we wouldn't have been having this conversation 500 years ago. If we were, we right. probably would have been burned at the stake. Uh, but, it, you know, now maybe it's not not just a bunch of, um, you know, talk over beers. Now we're talking about being able to potentially build things like this. And it's a real conversation about the future of what uh, what a good and fair society looks like, not just for us, but for, for all entities that should be inside the circle. Do you think that we need a theory of consciousness that's reliable that we have confidence in before we can get to that point or can we do it more empirically? Uh, no, I think you, I think that's something that would be part of this is that you'd say, you know, okay, so we think of the world and we, we are our thing in the world in a particular way. Maybe we decide some moral philosopher thinks 
that particular thing is, ne is necessary in order to have the properties that we want to ascribe to, you know, the things inside the circle. So you have to have um, certain properties that are reflective of this idea that we have an internal model of a certain sort. So presumably, if you're good enough to be able to build one of those things, you understand it well enough, you could ascribe a measure to uh, anything, like a dog or a cup or whatever. And you could literally go in and take your consciousness meter and apply it to that thing and say, okay, this score is 0.3, that's not enough because it needs to be one or else it's not a, it's not a person. Now, maybe that's a way that you could do it. Um, I think in the short term, uh, it's unlikely that anyone would accept any prem any measurement that you proposed, no yeah. matter how well-founded it was. So if I came out tomorrow and I said, okay, here's how we measure consciousness. We do blah, 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 and blah, 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 and here's the answer. No matter how potentially true it was or defensible, no one is even going to pay attention for one thing because, you know, the what difference does it make? This is just some weird thing, just like a bunch of other weird things. You know, most people who study consciousness – I think again are well-meaning, but uh, it's it's the sort of thing that's really hard to convince somebody that you've got a good answer, no matter what it is. Uh, at some point, maybe you'll have this idea that there are certain things that are that are have it and some that don't. I'm I'm more I suppose like intuitively pan-psychic when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. The idea that the these things every every property of the mind that we have names for. Are uh, exist on a on a spectrum in many dimensions. They're not a fixed yes or no. You have a little bit or a lot of it in a lot of different ways. Uh, whether you're an oak tree or a human, you you possess every single property that we think of in terms of uh, you know the 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 various words that we use to describe the internal experience. But you have them maybe in different amounts and potentially in different dimensions. Uh, and by the way, that doesn't make us greater than. It makes us different than. And this this idea that the biological creatures are different than and not greater than is a really key idea as we transition into this new, next phase where we now have this uh, this new form of life, like machine life, didn't exist before. Now it will. Um, the the idea that we're not necessarily the best at everything, but that doesn't mean that we're less than. Mm -hmm. So we can make something that can can calculate the product of two integers way faster than any human can. Does that mean we're less than? No, it just means we're different. We just don't, we can't compute products of integers as fast as a computer can. Uh, we're better at other things. And even if we weren't, who cares? If there were machines that were better than us at everything, it doesn't change who we are. It's kind of like that cucumber grape experiment. It's like, you know, if you give if you give a, the monkey the, the cucumber, oh, he's yeah. happy. But if you give the other monkey the grape, he's pissed because the other monkey got the grape. And why did you give me the cucumber? So I think that, that the this idea that you can be content with what you have, even if you're not the best at everything, is a very important idea. You know, I, I could never play in the NBA. You know, I just can't. Yep. There's no way I ever could. I could have I could have trained every minute of every day of my life and I would never have been able to do that. There are humans on the planet who are just better than me at basketball. And if you go down at every single human endeavor, every single one, there's somebody alive today that's better than me at all, every single one. Does that make me feel worse about my life? No. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't when we're talking about machines. In some future where there's a machine that's better than you at everything, it's no different than now. You're already not the best at everything you do. And so this this idea that the, the being better than is somehow like, uh, an objective is ridiculous. It goes back to this earlier thing about like, why are we here? What's our purpose and all, all that? So I maybe have gone through an evolution in my thinking about this as I've gotten older, but being better at everything is not the purpose of your life. It's just not because you're going to fail. If the purpose of your life yeah. was to always win at everything, your life is a failure by definition. If you want to be the Olympic gold medalist in freestyle wrestling at 82 kilos, which I did for a long time, the fact that I didn't achieve that, and I never will, if that was the defining element of my life, means that everything that I've done in my life is a failure, just because I'm not the best. But mm -hmm. that's the wrong way to look at things. Like the, the, the path through your life has ups and downs. You're going to have things that you view as successes and things that you view as failures. All these things are relative. They're not absolute. And you can do all of the things that you've ever done 
in the background of having a bunch of intelligent machines running around. Nothing is stopping you from still doing what you're doing, even if there's a machine that's better than cleaning your carpet than you are. It doesn't matter. In fact, the machine being better at cleaning your carpet than you are frees you up to not have to worry about cleaning your carpet. Or, you know, if the, the robot dentist is better at keeping your teeth healthy than the human dentist, the human dentist doesn't have that work anymore, but by God, you've got great teeth. And in the, in the main, what's more important, even if you're a dentist, you could do something else. You know, there, there's, so, there's an enormous infinite number of things that you can do that don't necessarily boil down to who's the best at it. In fact, there's everything is like this, um, yeah. that, that I, I don't have any uh, concern at all for the, the, the future in terms of like work replacement and things being better than us. I mean, let's just accept that it's going to happen and figure out how to make the best possible outcome. And, and there's a ton of very, very cool outcomes that could come of this. Well, it's a fascinating topic and a very exciting vision for the future that you have. And I'm, I'm glad you, you stopped by to share it. We're going to have to do this again. There's just too much to talk about. Uh, but thank you so much, Jordy, for making the time. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks. It was, it was fun. Uh, have me on again and I'll go on for another hour. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will. Yeah, I'm sure we will. Actually, is there, do you want to share any links? I know Sanctuary is sort of, uh, a, a sort of secretive right now, but are there any links that you want or that you can share uh, for that or any of your other work? Uh, well, so we, we've got, gone to great lengths to not have anything. <laughs> I, I did know that was Sanctuary, yeah. Uh, anything that you can find about Sanctuary is not what we do, uh, at least anymore. So the, the, you know, there isn't any, um, the, the, I'm not hard to find myself personally. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, uh, there's a lot of people, especially in the, uh, the, um, the machine learning community who know what I get a hold of me. So just ask somebody if you want my email or whatever, and, uh, I'll, I'll respond. Perfect. And I'll, I'll share your uh, social media as well. I think you're, you're on Twitter, right? I am. Yeah, it's more my, my, uh, it, the only reason I'm on Twitter is to follow Ashley Vance, who's absolutely hilarious. Uh, <laughs> there's really no other reason. It's, I, it's I think it's my, 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 my outlet for watching, you know, Muppet videos and, and cat memes. <laughs> that's, that's probably mentally healthier than the reason most people are, are on Twitter these days. So uh, you're definitely to be commended on that. Great. Well, thanks yeah. so much, Shorty.